The people who are going to leave the country, who are coming to our borders, are people who have resources and are enabled to do that. This does not mean, however, that the people who co and who come to our borders, who appear at our borders, have these resources. Because as we know, the journey, you may have those resources when you leave, but by the time you get to the border, the journey has robbed you of those resources. All right, so let's uh, let's get started. Uh, I am actually just discussing this. I am going to start with a statistic uh, noted by our speaker in the Great Decisions article for um, climate migration, tonight's topic. Um, and uh, we have the book, uh, for the Great Decisions book for sale upstairs after the event. Highly recommend it. Anyhow, according to the International Displacement Monitoring Center, in 2020, there were 30.7 million new disaster displacements, mostly resulting from weather-related disasters like floods and storms. So uh, to put that number in perspective, uh, Canada's population is 38 million. So that means that a large group of people nearly the size of Canada was forced from their homes with only some ultimately able to return uh, due to weather. And with the impacts of climate change um, increasing, uh, this number likely will rise. So where do these people go for refuge? What can be done to prevent this form of forced migration? Um, and, and how big is the problem? Um, and what, what should be done to support those who need help. Uh, things are not necessarily what they seem. That's my preview for our uh, discussion tonight. Fortunately, we have uh, with us Dr. Karen Jacobson to make sense of these questions and show us, among other things, why things may not be what they seem. Second time at Great Decisions at World Boston, as far as we both remember, uh, Dr. Karen Jacobson. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll abbreviate her bio, but you can see it in full on our website. Uh, by the way, she's as I mentioned, she is author of the climate migration chapter in the Great Decisions book, which you can pick up. It's an excellent resource. So uh, Dr. Jacobson is a Henry J. Lair Professor in Global Migration at the Fletcher School at Tufts and directs the Refugees in Towns project there. Um, she, her areas of expertise include refugee and migration issues, humanitarian assistance, in developing countries, urban impact, and climate change and migration. She's actually right now working on a book about uh, the urban, urban impact of refugees. Um, her recent books, or, or previous books, include A View from Below, Conducting Research in Conflict Zones, and The Economic Life of Refugees, uh, which is widely used in courses on forced migration. Uh, Dr. Jacobson uh, consults and works closely with UNHCR and other UN agencies and international NGOs. She's a citizen of both South Africa and the US and splits her time between Brookline and Western Maine. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Jacobson. Thank you very much, Mary. It's great to be here. Lovely to see you all. Thanks so much for coming. Um, right. Um, I wanted to, to tonight to talk about the issue of climate migration, but to, to look at it from the perspective of trying to understand how we talk about it, the, the kinds of narratives that are being reproduced in the media all the time about climate related migration. <clears throat> and, and the damage, the problems that, that are arising from these kinds of narratives. Um, we're seeing the media is full of warnings and images about the millions and millions of people who are likely to become climate migrants in the future. So by climate migrants, I mean people who are displaced by the impacts of climate change. Uh, they're sometimes misleadingly, I would argue, called climate refugees, but I'm going to get to that issue later. I want to look at tonight to try to explain the movement of people and how that movement is related to climate change. 
And I'm going to look at, at, I'm going to try to take apart that movement and look at patterns of this movement. I think it's really important to understand these patterns of mobility. Uh, how and why <clears throat> mobility occurs, and also particularly why, when and how and why it does not occur. Because as I'm going to argue tonight, most of the world's migrants, most of the world's population are not migrants. Only about 4% of the world's population is now or ever has been international migrants. And even if we include internal migration where people move within their country, we're still looking at the fact that most of the world's population do not leave their homes and stay put. And that same pattern is in place for, for climate affected migration as I'll argue. So I think it's really important to understand <clears throat> these patterns of, of migration, whether we're just ordinary media consumers, whether we're policymakers, or whether we're climate advocates, we need to get a handle on what it means when people are, are, are uh, displaced or needing to migrate as a result of migration. And because without that understanding, I would argue, we are all going to succumb to these dominant doom and gloom narratives <clears throat> that are out there and which are often underpinned by misinformation. So for example, many of, of you might have read the 2020 New York Times article by, by Abram Lustgarden, which was called The Great Climate Migration Has Just Begun. This was a really well-researched piece in the New York Times, but the main message that came across was that millions of climate migrants, especially from, from Central America in that case, are on their way to our borders. And I see this as a serious misconception. And that is also quite harmful in, in that it, it has nefarious influences on policymakers as well as on the general public. So let me talk a little bit about narratives and media narratives and why I think that we need to look at them more carefully. When I started working in the migration field back in the 90s, there were already predictions out there by people like Norman Myers, who's a well-regarded Oxford uh, researcher, that hundreds and of millions of climate refugees, he called them environmental refugees, would besiege our borders within a few years. And uh, these, these, and subsequently, since Norman Myers, many others have made similar kinds of predictions. But these numbers have failed to materialize. We do have large numbers of people at our borders. I would argue that they are not climate-related migrants for the most part, although climate plays a part in their migration. But certainly, we cannot call them climate refugees. Especially on the US's southern border, those people are definitely not fleeing climate-related factors, although again, that does affect their poverty. So, But this morning, as I was preparing for this talk, I, I googled quickly the, the term, how many climate migrants? And it yielded the top story by some Zurich insurance company, I'm sure a very large company, with the giant headline, there could be 1.2 billion climate refugees by 2050. So I did not explore their data or analysis, but this was the first piece that came up, and it's not untypical. If we, if we extrapolate, the UN estimates the world population in 2050 will be about 9.8 billion. That means if there are 1.2 billion climate refugees, that means 12% of the world's population would become migrants. And today this number is less than is way less than 4%. So it would mean that all of a sudden, many more, much larger numbers of people would be able to migrate. And I'm going to argue that that is just not the case. So the same narrative about these billions of people coming our way is, is continues today. And these narratives are built on increasingly sophisticated models of future climate change. These models are very useful when it comes to understanding climate change, but they're not so useful when it comes to understanding migration. 
This is because compared with climate change, migration is a much more difficult issue to model or predict, especially using econometrics and simple gravity push-pull models that are usually involved in these kinds of models. Mass migration in particular is very difficult to predict and to model. It's because, because mass migration basically comes down to individuals' decision to move. And these decisions are driven by all kinds of factors. Those factors are context dependent, culturally dependent sometimes, and they're also family specific. And so whether a person or a community or a village or a town or whoever, whether they migrate or not, is not an easy thing to predict or to model, especially not at global levels or even sometimes at national levels. So <clears throat> these individual preferences and resources, as well as local and national and global factors, are all determining whether, how, whether, whether people, individuals or families and households or communities and villages, whether they, they migrate or not, and it's very difficult to predict. Some, some scholars today are even arguing that it's, it's not really useful to try to predict numbers. Since there's plenty of recent scholarship out there that talks about climate migration myths and suggests we need to go beyond estimating migrant numbers because these models reinforce these mass migration narratives that lead to fear mongering about, about our borders, about security risks, and can even lead, push policymakers or enable policymakers to close borders. So these are the narratives that are, that are confronting us. So I, I would like now to turn to look at, to what, at patterns of movement when, we talk, when we're talking about climate, climate related migration. So, in the migration field, we, we generally think about two types of migration. <clears throat> One kind is what we call forced displacement. And that is the idea that people have to flee unexpectedly, usually from some kind of acute event, like a disaster, like an earthquake or a hurricane, but could also be from a sudden outbreak of violence, of armed conflict, an upsurge of, of persecution. And it, it, it appears, it, it occurs very suddenly and forces people to flee very suddenly from their homes. We refer to that as displacement. People are displaced. By contrast, we think of migration. So migration is usually a more planned and organized form of movement. If you're planning to migrate, you have you do it over time. You, you wait and, not, and try to save your funds. You may strategize, but your, your household may strategize, for example, how to dispose of your assets. You may strategize about which family members should leave should the whole family leave? Should some people stay behind to look after the, the farm or the business or the house? And sh or should you send <clears throat> your most you know, entrepreneurial and, and smartest family member to go out and, and set the anchor to which you can come later? You can strategize all of this. And but in particular, you can also save money so that you can pay the smuggler. As we know today, in most migration settings, you're not going anywhere unless you use a smuggler. So migration and displacement are two very different phenomena. It, and, is, and applies to all kinds of migration, whether it's related to economic migration, whether it's related to uh, climate migration or to conflict-related migration. <clears throat> so when it comes to climate change, we also think about two different types of climate change. We think about sudden onset disasters. So these are acute events such as hurricanes or tornadoes or wildfires, all of which are becoming more intense as a result of climate change. And these can result in people being forcibly displaced from their homes, either because their homes are destroyed or they're rendered unlivable and so people are displaced and they flee, like we saw in, in Hurricane Katrina. 
But the experience of a disaster, of a sudden onset disaster, can also undermine or destroy people's livelihoods so that over time it renders people less able to survive and eventually they will have to move, but maybe not immediately. The second kind of, of climate event that we talk about is, is slow onset events, <clears throat> such as sea level rise or drought. And these are more drawn out events that create change for people's lives over longer periods. Over time, faced with sea level rise, people gradually lose their ability to cope, their assets are eroded, <clears throat> and they are eventually unable to survive in the place where they are. You, for, for example, you can manage drought. You, if you're a farmer living, say, in the Sahel, you can manage drought for a couple of years uh, because drought you know, is, is endemic in many, many areas, and so people can how to cope with it. <clears throat> but with sustained or much more intense drought, it's much more difficult, and over time, you may, be, you may find that your reserves are too diminished, you're unable to recover those reserves, you have to sell off your assets, and eventually your ability to cope is so eroded that you must leave. So a sudden, uh, slow onset events are also going to push migration, but in different ways than sudden, on, sudden, um, sudden onset disasters will. Now, both these kinds of climate-related events are, are associated with what I want to frame as three different types of movement, three patterns of movement. The first kind, and, I, and to me the most predominant kind, is the fact that faced with either kind of event, whether it's a, a sudden onset disaster or a slow onset event, not everyone leaves. In fact, Many fewer people leave than we would expect to the point of where in fact, most people do not leave. So most disasters that you can think of, if you really look at who, who leaves and who stays, the majority of people stay. If they don't stay, if they literally have to flee, like for example, if there's an earthquake, there, this leads to a second type of movement which is that if people are displaced, they don't necessarily go very far. They may go, um, they may go just you know, outside their village or up, up into the hills where it's safe, or they may relocate to nearby villages or towns. They'll move to a short distance to a safer place. And then depending on what happens to their homes, if their homes have not been destroyed, um, or if there is some re reconstruction occurring, they will return. So these two patterns together, the fact that some people don't leave at all, most people don't leave at all, that, that more people when they do, are displaced travel only short distances and return, means that over time, most people are going to not be, dis, are not going to migrate, are not going to move. So they're, well, we're looking at a situation where, where even if there is a climate disaster or a climate change event, that does not mean that the people who are affected by that event will move. Most of them will not move. So what we're seeing with many of the, the, the more popular pieces that are coming out is that people talk about the number of people who will be affected by climate change. That is not the same as the number of people who will migrate. And these patterns of migration that I'm talking about, where most people stay or move short distances to return, are very typical of all kinds of migration, whether it's climate-related climate migration, or whether it's conflict-related, or whether or whatever it is, most people stay as close to home as possible or sometimes don't leave at all. And, you know, we have many classic examples of that from Katrina and elsewhere, where people just refuse to, to be evacuated, even in the face of wildfires. So why don't people leave? This is now this this issue, which we are called, which is called immobility studies, is now really becoming increasingly well researched in this field. And there are two basically two two reasons. First of all, let me just ask you: you probably know people who have homes or live in homes or, or have homes um, 
that are in in very hazardous areas. Maybe they're right on the urban, wild urban interface. They're facing wildfires like in the hills of California and the West Coast, or they might be on, on the cliffs or on the sea, a coastal, I mean, on the edge of the sea or the edge of the ocean in, in the islands or the Cape. And, and, and are these people moving? Some of them are, but most of them are not. So, why is it that people won't move? Well, it's pretty obvious, really. What we're seeing in even very threatened areas, like small island states like Kiribati or the Maldives or the Florida Keys or California hill towns, when people are not moving away, or if they do, they'll move only temporarily and then return, the same pattern. And the reason is two, two factors. First, People don't move because they don't want to. And that's very simple. And we, we have a technical term for it. It's called place attachment. Place attachment refers to the emotional or other kinds of bonds that, that hold a person in place and make it difficult for them to uproot themselves. And, and, and this place attachment, I mean, it's a, it's a really complicated social psychological idea, but really it's about how, how much you feel involved with, connected to, tied to, rooted in your home. And that attachment can override both the desire to move and the need to move. Even though you know you should move, even though it makes sense, you, you don't. That phenomenon of place attachment is a large piece of, of the explanation for why people don't move. But there's a second obvious reason too, and that is that people lack the resources to move. To move, to migrate, you need assets. You need to be able to pay the smuggler, like I said. You need to, to be able to dispose of your whatever, of um, other household assets or large assets that you have, and that may not always be easy. You might have a house or a business, you cannot leave that behind. But more importantly, or, or equally importantly to having assets and cash, is that you, in order to migrate, you need to have a network. It's very difficult for people to just pick up, leave, even if they can just, just uh, dispose of their assets, and just move to a place where they don't know anybody. Very few people do that. Most people move to areas, to towns, to if necessary, other countries, where they know, where they have a, some sort of community of co-ethnics or co-nationals or co-religious people who will provide them with some kind of support and assistance. With, uh, absent that, it becomes very difficult to, to settle into a new place. And what we see is that people always gravitate toward areas where there are commu existing communities which will help them settle in, help them find work, help them find housing, and so forth. So the power of these two factors, either by themselves or together, is the main reason why, why relatively small numbers of people migrate, and also why distance, the distance people migrate, is inversely correlated with movement. In other words, the longer the distance to travel, the smaller the number of displaced people or migrants will ever make that journey. So just, I'm getting to the, to the, to the end here. I realize I'm running out of time, but, but um, the third pattern of movement that we, I, so the first pattern was that people stay home. The second pattern was that people move very small distances so that they can come back quickly. The third pattern is that some people who are displaced or who, who are thinking about migrating will move further away, perhaps to the capital of the country, if they're far from that, <clears throat> large cities in the country. And of course, many people also move to other countries. So this group is, is of course the one that we're interested in because those are the people who will come to our borders. But this group is much smaller than the first two types. And it is also, it also consists of, of a very particular kind of group, that is people who have resources. That is because, as I said, in order to migrate, you have to have resources. And the longer the distance, the more international migration, the more countries you cross, 
the more substantial those resources need to be. What are these resources that you need? In addition to cash to pay the smuggler, like I mentioned, you need other kinds of things. You need human capital. So for example, you need to be fairly strong. You need to have certain skills. You need to have reasonably good health. Those are the people who are more likely to embark on a journey. Not always, but mostly. What else do you need? Um, you need, like I said, this network in the destination area. And this network is going to help you find all these things that you need, housing, jobs, getting assistance, and so forth. So the people who are going to leave the country who are coming to our borders are people who have resources in, in able to do that. This does not mean, however, that the people who, co and who come to our borders, who appear at our borders, have these resources because as we know the journey you may have those resources when you leave but by the time you get to the border the journey has robbed you of those resources during a journey you are literally often robbed of your cash but also you may lose your health you may lose your youth because journeys sometimes take many years people stop along the way takes a long time and so it so people who leave with resources do not arrive with those resources. However, it's worth recognizing that the people who come to our borders are a subset, are a, a more resourced, in some cases, uh, wealthier in, in, many, in many, many dimensions, having more human capital and financial capital and other kinds of capital. They're a subset of the people that they left behind and they're they have, they have these resources, at least potentially. So the people who make it to our borders are kind of an elite group of those who, elite subset of those who are affected by climate change. So what does all this mean? Why is, why is it in, in, interesting or important? How does understanding these patterns help us prepare for what's to come? So the migrants who reach our borders have left their countries for many different reasons. Most of them, however, <clears throat> share the experience of having lost their livelihoods and security as a result of, of the impact of climate change, but other things as well. They have become more impoverished because of maybe policy uh, or lack of policy or bad policy in their countries. There may have been armed conflict and violence and persecution in their home areas. And all these factors combine to create a push to have people move. Um, these, these, these factors, climate change, armed conflict, poverty and growing endemic poverty and plus uh, um, increasing poverty as a result of climate change and other factors. Some, some, many of these factors are often all in play in the same country. So for example, many sending countries like, I, can, I mean, we can name countries in Africa, South Sudan, Somalia, Northern Nigeria, Afghanistan, uh, Guatemala here in our own neighborhood. All of these factors are in play of these countries. So people are moving for, um, for multiple reasons, not just climate change, but also because their situation has become much more dire from other factors. So what it means is it's very difficult to assign an identity to people, to say that this person is a climate migrant and this person is a refugee and this person is an economic migrant. These factors are all mixed together and this is why UN agencies and donor governments and researchers increasingly talk about mixed migration. So even though we do separate out the idea of refugees and, and, and migrants, we know that many people who, who come to our borders would qualify as, as refugees, but they don't apply because they know it's very difficult to reach status. And that many of the migrants who come to our borders are really in need of protection, of the protection, the legal protection that's granted refugees, but they don't, they won't get it and they don't apply. So I guess the main reason that I, the main uh, uh, piece that I want to leave with you is that 
Migrants who reach our borders are not the poorest of the poor, nor do they come with nothing. They come with assets and skills and other kinds of human capital, even if they don't have financial resources. And for them, for these people, migration is a, an, adapt, an adaptation strategy. It is not a last resort. It is not the poorest of the poor who are coming because they have nothing left. The migrants who come have been able to navigate their journeys and have been able to leave because they have some resources and they have chosen this journey for the most part. Not all, again, there are always some people who have had no choice, but I'm talking about most people. So what we're seeing when we look at people at our borders are that people seem to be very poor and to have nothing. And in this, that particular in, instance, they are. But these are people who have come from an area where there are many much poorer people who were not able to migrate. And so these people are, you know, the more privileged and in some cases more resourced people who are, who are reaching our borders and therefore much more likely to contribute to our economy. So I think it's really important that we understand that not everybody who's affected by climate change is going to migrate, and that only a small subset is going to, and that that, that, that subset is actually quite a well-off subset in some, relatively at least. <clears throat> what does it mean though for everyone who is left behind and who are, will not be able to migrate? This is an issue that is going to confront us as, is going to confront us as, uh, for, when governments think about how to aid and assist other countries, and for us to think about how what we can do to support people who are unable to migrate. So I won't get into that right now, but perhaps we could discuss it. Finally, I just want to say one really quick thing about climate refugees. This is a, a VEX term that people use a lot, and there are lots of different views on using this term. I believe we should not refer to climate-related migrants as climate refugees. The concept of climate refugees does not exist in international refugee law, and nor should it, because the term refugee is reserved for someone who's been severe, severely persecuted in their home country for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. This is a well-accepted definition of refugee, which has been in place as part of international refugee law since 1950. It is, does not include people who may have had to move because of, because of climate change. It is, it is a term that is, it, that is directly um, concerned with people's individual persecution. And while some would argue, well, people are persecuted by the climate, that doesn't really, doesn't really cut it. There are more practical reasons that we should not include climate-related migrants in, 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 the, in when we think about refugee populations. And that is that our, the, the definition of refugees and the protections that are, that are given to refugees are under threat today. If we start opening up that definition and trying to include more people in that definition, we are at risk of losing what we have by way of protecting the existing refugees today who are under a lot of, of, of threat in their home countries. So I'm getting the word here and I'm going to start there. Thanks, Mary, for your patience. Thank you so much, everybody. How about now? Oh, wow, yes. We're on. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Karen. Um, so we are gonna take questions, but I'm going to um, ask a question first uh, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, so um, in, in your piece, you talk about um, sort of ends of the economic spectrum and adaptations um, that occur both on the level of uh, say wealthier uh, entities, businesses, um, and uh, for example, on the level of indigenous peoples. And um, some of these adaptations allow people to, uh, or entities, I should say, uh, to stay or not go very far. So uh, looking to the future in positive developments, I wonder if you could just briefly touch on some positive things that are going on. 
I was going to be positive. I think and when we go yeah, right up to your mic so we can all hear you. Yeah. There are indigenous people who are being affected by climate change. The obvious ones are people in, say, for example, the Arctic, who are in, who are seriously affected by climate change and who are losing their homes literally and having to move. Even there, again, we're seeing people not moving as much as we would expect. But as you point out, people one, one thing that is happening as a result of people wanting to stay is that they're doing everything they can to adapt to this changing um, situation. And so that is one area uh, um, where um, technology can help and where, go where governments and, and even entrepreneurs can, can move in to help people adapt to, to the, their, um, their, their new change situation. And we are seeing that. And I gave some examples in the, in the piece, <clears throat> many different examples. I mean, technology is one area where we are seeing all kinds of really rapid changes. For I'll give you one example from my own university, which is Tufts University. Uh, one of the things, one of the big pieces that we're seeing in the Arctic now, we have an Arctic program, is that um, there are all kinds of geoengineering projects that are that are in place now, and that are uh, this is all over the world. We but we have one at um, at, at Tufts, and one of the things that, that is interesting about it, geoengineering is in the Arctic, one of the, the issues that's, that's in play is whether, how we can stop the melting of ice. The melting of ice is, 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 is speeding up, uh, especially now with the opening of the Northwest Passage, there's more shipping, there's more soup, there's more black uh, particulate matter, and that is, that is aggravating the, the ice melt. And so there's all kinds of interesting technologies that are in play, including um, Literally covering the ice so that with with a with a subs with a material that can that will stop the the melt happening so far. So there are these kinds of technologies that are in play. But but we what we what we need to do with technology is understand what impact they'll have on on human beings on on on, on migration too. Will the will the technology be focused on trying to stop climate change or trying to stop the ice melt in this case, or are these technologies going to be helping people stay where they are, which is what, as I'm in arguing, most people want to do. And so there are these kinds of technologies in place too, but there are also going to have to be policies that help people stay where they are. Those technologies are going to have to be matched by policies. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, let's see for questions. Sorry. Um, oh, and by the way, um, I'm apologizing ahead of time. Um, uh, if you see me using my cell phone, it's because that's how I'm staying in touch with um, my colleagues. So yeah, right here, down here. Can we get uh, this gentleman in the front row? Uh, Mike is coming to you. Uh, first off, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, with global warming, what are the countries that stand to benefit by way of uh, improved agricultural productivity? And um, other than place attachment, what's preventing people from moving to those places? That's, a, that's great. Um, I, I think we don't, haven't yet seen how, I mean, well, we, we've seen anecdotally, and I'm sure there is research, which I don't know about, <laughs> on which on how agriculture is, agricultural regions are changing and enabling new kinds of agriculture to emerge and other, other kinds of agriculture to die. But um, certainly I can imagine that people are moving to these areas, and this would be one place, uh, one area of research that would be of great interest. I, in my own area, which is tends to be Africa and the Middle East, where I'm focusing on, we the prob there are there are complications with this. What we're seeing there is rather than people being able to move into new agricultural zones, we're seeing corporations take over those co those agricultural zones in, in their efforts to increase food production for their own countries. And so there are there are other complications with. These kinds of changes that you're alluding to, it, it is not a simple matter of new agricultural zones emerging to which people could migrate in order to, to 
their lives. I think uh, we have to be very mindful of who's taking over those new agricultural zones and in whose interests that, that takeover would be. But I think it's a really interesting question that could be, that should be, and is being, you know. Great, thank you. Uh, right here on the, on the aisle, and I want to commend you, sir, because questions at World Boston end with question marks. So thank you for your nice yeah. question. And uh, go right ahead. So um, thank you, Dr. J Jacobson. It's a real pleasure to hear sort of a sober factual recitation as opposed to what you refer to as, as sort of overkill in the media and not to mention our political um, pundits everywhere. You would think that we were being invaded at every turn. Um, so I feel weird uh, with my back to everybody. So I'm just going to tell people that I'm a semi-retired State Department person who worked on, headed up our International Migration Office for several years. And Dr. Jacobs and I overlapped a few times. Okay. So I want to ask you something that um, you didn't really touch on, but I know you're expert on, and that's how you take care of these people once they are displaced and are vulnerable. And what I found, we both done a fair amount of work in the UN and I, you know, value that kind of multilateral um, set of relationships hugely. But I came to believe over time yeah. that that kind of assist, uh, effort is very slow and very plodding and is a lot of great thinking, but isn't a lot of great doing. And over time, I came to believe that the uh, sort of heart mm -hmm. of assistance should be not in even uh, national governments, but in states and cities and local governments and non-governmental associations and people um, like in the city of Boston, which has an okay. extremely robust set of you know, assistance. And I wonder about your thoughts on that. No, it's great. I, I mean, when we look at who helps refugees and migrants, the, pe the people who help them are what we call civil society, that is, and particularly the people who help them are their own people who have who have come before. So like I said, people have networks uh, in, in cities or towns that they head to. And these networks are the ones that provide the first assistance and the last assistance. An NGO might come in and support, you know, a, a livelihood program or, or provide food assistance if it's the, the World Food Program or like you said, the UN agencies are there to support people, but they rely on and 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 need people, uh, refugees and migrants rely on and need their own people to help them much more than I mean. We tend to hear how the UN is helping, like you say, but in fact, when we look at what is actually happening, it's people's own people who are there who are helping, and also the host population. So people move into areas. My own work looks a lot at informal settlements and slum areas of the world's large cities or particularly cities and Middle East. And when you look at what's happening in these areas, these informal areas and slums are where migrants move and where refugees move and where poor, very poor people live. And in, in these areas, there are not many programs that either the government or the UN is, is, is um, supporting. So it's the people themselves who are doing it. So I'm really interested in, like you say, how, how people have mobilized themselves uh, community-based organizations that are formed within these communities to help the people in within these communities. And I think it's really important that we find ways to support those communities uh, the, and those organizations rather than bringing in, uh, you know, international programs and so forth or, or supporting international NGOs who are often have, you know, they come in and then they go. Well, the people who stay and who live there are the ones who are going to do the work of supporting the migrants who come and those migrants in turn become those people who will support new ones. And so we really have to think about the dynamic of what happens in cities, which is that the people who come to these cities become the people who live there and support others and how cities grow. So yeah, we, we think too much about humanitarian assistance and not enough about the local assistance that's happening. Very good. So I think um, we have a question from Zoom that one of my colleagues is gonna read out. Yes, thank you. I'm reading from Zoom. Um, you mentioned the difference between climate migrants and climate refugees and whether or not we should use that term at all. Um, what factors impact a person's ability to apply for asylum based on climate change? And is there any other legal recourse based on international law? 
Yeah, this is this is a really important issue that for people to understand. In international refugee and asylum law, there is no definition of a climate refugee. The only definition of a refugee is 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 as I said, a person who is persecuted by specific state entities and for reasons re uh, related to their race, political beliefs. Uh, you know, religion and so forth. And so people who are displaced by climate or who move because of climate are, are, are more in the category of people of economic migrants who are leaving because they are unable to, to, to support themselves, to find a living, who cannot support their families and so forth. And there are no, well, I mean, there are treaties and conventions to that are aimed at migrant workers. Those treaties and conventions are very undersubscribed, very, very few countries have ratified them. And it's simply because most, most countries really, are, it's not in their interest to worry about migrants. So, but, so there's a big difference between refugees, at least in, in terms of international law, mm -hmm. between refugees and, and migrants. And these legal, and but what happens if you get defined as a refugee is, is you're eligible for protection and assistance in the country that defines you as a refugee. If we open this up, like I said, it's just we would never open it up because if we opened it up, the whole treaty and the whole, the whole protection architecture that exists globally would, would disappear. And so there's been long debates for years about whether we should change the definition of the refugees to include people like climate migrants. And the agreement is if we did that, we would never get a better treaty than we have already, the 1951 Convention on, on refugee, the Status of Refug Refugees. We would get a much worse treaty and a much more limited treaty. And, um, and we probably wouldn't even get a treaty at all because many countries would, would, would like to do away with their obligations to refugees. So the idea is we, st we should stick with what we've got because at least we have some protections built in place, but those will never be extended to climate related migrants, just as they will never be extended to economic migrants, even if those people are struggling just as much badly. Right, thank you. And actually, I'm going to piggyback on that question again at, at maybe the higher end of the scale. Um, can we consider, I mean, there's also another category, which is legal immigrants most people in this country somehow got here, if you go far enough back in that way, um, can we consider that some legal immigrants, whether to the US or, or else other destinations, some of them are moving for climate related reasons? Really, and, and I think the people who can make it to the US legally, if we look at who they are, they are people who have the resources to do that. They're able to navigate the legal system, the visa application system. They have the skills and the education and the, you know, computer um, knowledge and understanding to navigate that system. They are able to have the patience to wait for a visa. They are able to maybe engage a lawyer. It's it's for most people who are very poor and and maybe not fully literate. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So again, the people who are making it here legally are. The, are an elite. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, I don't think we have to worry about them very much. It's like, yeah. I mean, it's like when you look at Ukraine, okay, I'm going out on a limb here. When you look at Ukraine, the, the people who are being displaced from Ukraine are not having to worry about things very much because they are going to be accepted in the host countries that are taking them and they will be able to, as have mo many of them, almost half, returned to their, to their home country. What we have to worry about are very poor people who are from countries that are much less popular and have the wrong color skin and the wrong religion. And it's those people who are, will never get into the, the wealthy North and that and will be stuck in the, their home countries with all the problems of climate change and the rest of it. So it's those people that we have to worry about. Okay, great. So let's uh, see if we've got uh, more questions. Uh, yeah, right here in the middle. I think that's my Martin, name is Mark. I can't really see. Um, my question is, as a matter of policy, not necessarily limited to this country, but just in general, is there any migration that might be encouraged, like sort of nudge policy? Um, and I'm thinking of my question specifically to climate. 
encouraged by by policymakers or as a matter of policy thinking that this would be smart policy to start nudging today migration for some smart policy reason that's a very interesting idea um i would be very surprised okay so let's look at the countries that do encourage migration into them the Middle Eastern countries, for example, let's take Qatar and the recent World Cup. Uh, those countries encourage for five, ha, have a long-standing history of encouraging labor migration for their own purposes because the Gulf countries uh, don't have a citizens, citizenry who are going to do construction. So there are some countries that need migrants and always have needed them and encourage them to come under very strict sy uh, systems and with very few rights. Are there countries that are going to encourage migration, climate-related migration, in the way that you suggest? I would be surprised if it was international migration that we found any instances where that happens. On the other hand, internal migration is, is a much more in play. And the, the classic case here is Bangladesh. So Bangladesh, as you can imagine, the, the delta area of Bangladesh is sinking and is a great risk for the for storms storm surge and sea level rise so the so what has the bangladesh government done about this so there are two strategies that are in place for bangladesh one is that you try to keep people where they are and discourage them from moving to the capital of dhaka because the capital is already way too big and way too too overpopulated you might say so there are some in the government who argue, let us do everything we can to help people adapt to mitigate this climate, this climate um, impact and, and discourage movement from, from this, the delta to the city, to the, to the capital. Another group, this is often supported by UN and other, and other advocacy groups, but also some in the government. So here's where the government is split argues that no, we should manage migration. We should encourage and enable people to come in a managed and orderly way, that we should allow them and encourage them to leave the, the coastal area, which is sinking, and enable them to come to the city. And this debate with the leavers and the encouragers to come is really very actively in play in Bangladesh. And you could argue that a similar kinds of dynamics are in play in other countries. Uh, the Maldives, for example, is an example of, of where the, literally the islands are being, um, you know, overtaken by the sea level rise. And the government has been extremely proactive in trying to, to, to deal with this problem to the point where they had this under, underwater, undersea parliamentary meeting and so forth. So governments are really seized with these, with these issues, especially governments of, of affected countries. And for, but for them, the issue is whether to try to stop migration which I've been arguing is not that hard because people don't want to migrate, whether to kind of manage the migration in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an orderly way. And we'll see how this plays out. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. But uh, I, when it comes to international migration, people crossing borders, very unlikely to, to see that, that kind of orderly kind of managed process. It hasn't happened yet, but it might. Okay, so we're unfortunately we're getting down to time, but we will have some more discussion upstairs. Um, and I realized that in my um, opening, I don't think I mentioned Natalie. Uh, I want to thank Natalie and the rest of our team who are here. Natalie Mace is our uh, director of um, global engagement programs. So Natalie um, and uh, Karen, maybe we can do sort of a lightning round and take two questions at once and wrap it up there. So Natalie, I think you have. Um, uh, somebody next to you, and then you have one on Zoom, right? Isn't there somebody right around here? So we'll do two questions with haiku answers to fit into our time. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. So I was just, you alluded to um, climate migration contrib contributing to urbanization and the growth of informal settlements, slums, and to just your on the balance, are, are would you say that migrants' lives are improving when they migrate, when they urbanize, or are they just trading one set of problems for a different set of, you know, crime and poor sanitation, hygiene? Okay. And then uh, you had a Zoom question. Yes, uh, this is a Zoom question from John Plant. Uh, could you briefly comment on the areas of the world that may become uninhabitable at three or four degrees of temperature increase? Hmm. 
Um, to the first one, it's that's a, that's an observation that is yeah. Is is rural poverty and devastation better than urban poverty and devastation? I mean, I, it's really difficult. This is where I think we need to focus our efforts. Everybody, the policymakers, donors on trying to improve urban poverty and urban settlements, because that is where people are, are moving to when they have to move. And that is, those are manageable problems. And we are seeing countries dealing with that. One country that is that is dealing with it pretty well or doing their best is my own country, which is South Africa, which is trying to, to manage this problem of, of very rapid urbanization um, th there's a lot of crit criticism about it and really they're trying. Another country that, that's, that's doing relatively well is Rwanda. And Rwanda is also doing relatively well, not so much on human rights, but is also doing really well on issues, on, on environmental issues. Rwanda was the first country in Africa to ban plastic bags. It's been one of the initiators of the plastics treaty that's now in, in being ratified in Paris in, next month. And so, so there are countries that have taken a very proactive stance on trying to deal with their um, urban problems. And I, I'm more familiar with African situations, but again, China and India are, have also really taken this on. So, but, I, but to your question, I think that whatever the answer is, what, what is happening in the future is that, they will, the, the, that the urbanization trend that we're seeing will, will increase. And it is driven by, in part, climate change, which is wiping out the ability to, to live in rural areas. And, and that sort of links up to the Zoom question oh, yeah. of, are there certain regions that will become uninhabitable? Yeah, that, that I, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there are. I, I don't have any special information. Like I'm sure there would be some. Okay. So um, uh, thank you. And audience, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Jacobson uh, for very Thanks. informative talk. Thank you for your questions. They were really good. And I can't clap like this, but um, and thank you, audience, uh, for joining us. Um, and uh, we hope to see everybody. Um, April 20th uh, for James Cronin and our Chat and Chowder book talk. And we'll see you upstairs in two seconds. Thanks, good night. <laughs>